Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, it is 6 p.m. in Paris, 5 p.m. in London, noon in New York, and it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome you all to this uh, uh, educational activity by the International Academy for Clinical Hematology. This is our first webinar after the uh, summer break, I would say, and it is uh, uh, dedicated to a very important topic, an update on the new data uh, of antibody drug conjugates for multiple uh, myeloma. I'm Mohamed Moti from the Sorbonne University and St. Antoine Hospital in Paris in France, and I'll be joined today by a distinguished uh, colleague, top expert in this field, namely uh, Professor Rakesh Popat from University College Hospital in London in the United Kingdom. These are my disclosures. This is a high-level education activity like all our other activities. We do have some very important learning objectives. So after participating in this webinar, you will be able, hopefully, to describe the potential advantages of ADCs in the treatment of patients with multiple myeloma. Also, uh, to be able to analyze the available efficacy and safety results of approved, but also emerging antibody drug conjugates in myeloma. Last but not least, uh, discuss uh, the different strategies to incorporate novel treatments into the management of patients with uh, multiple myeloma. So the agenda is very straightforward. Uh, I'll start with an introduction, sort of a big picture how ADCs work and their potential advantages, and they are really a backbone of treatments in cancer in general. And then uh, Dr. Popat uh, will give you a fantastic uh, update about the most recent clinical results. And he has uh, uh, in his practice a very, very large experience uh, using uh, antibody drug conjugates, especially the approved one, belentamab, in relapse refractory multiple myeloma. And we'll have enough time, I think, uh, to take questions and have some uh, discussion after the talk. And this is why it's a highly interactive uh, webinar. So you can interact uh, with us uh, by answering the polling questions. So I'll come to this in a couple of seconds. And uh, to do this, you have uh, uh, to exit the full screen mode if you want to participate in the poll and polling. And this will be on the right side of the screen next to the video. But I'm sure you're quite familiar with this. You've been doing this now for almost three years since this uh, uh, nasty pandemic uh, uh, popped in. And please uh, do not forget to complete the evaluation form at the end of the webinar. It's extremely important that we get your feedback in order to continue to improve and fulfill the educational uh, needs of the community. It's important to highlight that this is an independent medical education uh, program that was made possible thanks to an unrestricted educational grant received from uh, GSK. So in order to measure uh, the uh, learning impact, uh, uh, I will uh, ask you a couple of questions. They are relatively easy, but who knows, you know, we, uh, I'll show you the correct answers, of course, uh, in the post assessment. So, first question, pre-assessment question one, and as you may guess, there's no right or wrong answer. How confident are you in your ability to interpret available efficacy and safety results 
of the approved and emerging ADCs in multiple myeloma and incorporate them into your uh, clinical practice. And as I said, you know, you may be very confident, you may be moderately confident, depending on the availability of the agent, depending on your practice. So please don't hesitate to share with us uh, your uh, experience uh, here. Uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds to uh, continue uh, to vote. Yeah, you're doing great, guys. The numbers are increasing. And actually, they're not so bad. It looks like that we do have uh, people who are becoming more and more uh, familiar with these ADCs. Yes, please continue to vote. Let's, let's give three, four seconds if you agree, Rakesh. Okay. Well, uh, here, anyway, I think it's quite representative. We do have roughly 10% who are very confident. Well done, guys. 13% mostly confident. Actually, the majority are moderately confident. We do have equal numbers uh, around 13% of slightly or not confident. And, uh, of course, uh, we will see at the end if uh, uh, these figures will change which obviously would mean, if they have changed positively, that the educational objectives were achieved. My next question to you guys is, this is a very specific question. What is the most frequent adverse event associated with MEDI 228 according to the safety results from the phase one trial. And there's only one choice, by the way. And MEDI, one, uh, MEDI 2228 uh, has been shown in different congresses. This is an antibody drug conjugates, uh, which has been tested in multiple uh, myeloma. Uh, please don't mix it with, for instance, Belantamab. Uh, so is it about photophobia? Is it thrombocytopenia, keratopathy, pleural effusion? Please vote. We're looking forward to your uh, votes. It looks like that since I mentioned that this is not the code for Belentemab, it inspired you guys because the answers are changing. I can follow live actually the answers. This is amazing, you know. The uh, IT and technology is fantastic. Uh, one may wonder how these guys on the 19th century were living, you know, without all of these technologies. So, okay, let me share the answers with you. And I think you need to follow carefully what Dr. Popat will say, because actually uh, I have 15% who answered photophobia. 26% thrombocytopenia, 52% keratopathy, and 7% pleural effusion. You really need to follow uh, what Dr. Popat is going to say because you will see. You may not, I think you didn't get it right here. At least the majority didn't get it right. Okay, question three. What is the most frequent adverse event associated with belentamab, mafodotin, according to the safety results from the DREAM2 trial? And as you know, this is really a seminal a trial in relapse refractory multiple myeloma, uh, which uh, allowed uh, the drug uh, uh, to be now uh, widely used and uh, serving uh, many patients who are in need. Thrombocytopenia, keratopathy, anemia, rush. So maybe you're a dermatologist following us today. So you're very keen on, uh, yeah. Okay, please continue to vote guys. It looks like you're doing well, at least according to my dashboard. Uh, okay, we give you another two seconds. The most 
frequent. Single answer, by the way, not multiple choices. Okay, so let me give you the results. And it looks like that here, you guys, you're following clearly. 10% thrombocytopenia, 76% keratopathy. Well done. 3% anemia and 10% uh, rush. Okay. Well, I'll start now uh, with my introduction and obviously we'll come back to the assessment uh, questions. I don't think uh, that I need to convince you uh, and spend a lot of time highlighting the amazing changes we have seen in the uh, treatment of multiple myeloma over the last four or five decades. Obviously, don't worry, I'll not spend one hour on everything that happened in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Uh, probably you're well aware that uh, the introduction of high-dose melphalan uh, uh, being validated in a randomized trial in the mid-90s has been a crucial step towards improving the outcome of the patient. Then we had the protosum inhibitors, first generation, second generation, including oral protosum inhibitors. We had the imits, the lidomide, lenalidomide, pomalidomide. Soon we may have iberdomide and uh, mesigdomide. Now we call them cell modes. Of course, uh, uh, we have uh, HTEC inhibitors, which are still, I would say, a matter of concern, debated, but most importantly, it was about the introduction of monoclonal antibodies and the anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies like daratumumab and uh, isatuximab are clearly making a difference. But beside monoclonal antibodies, actually, antibody drug conjugate uh, and uh, the uh, first uh, in class which has been approved is balentamab uh, are also now making uh, a big uh, a, a big uh, difference in multiple myeloma in addition of course to other immune therapies like car t cells and uh, uh, bispecific antibodies and T cell engages. So you can see here uh, uh, the amazing uh, variety of the new generation immune therapies in multiple myeloma. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see the monoclonal antibodies with a different possible target. You can see the armed monoclonal antibodies, the bispecific antibodies, but also how can we engineer the immune effectors like NK cells or T cells uh, to uh, fight or to target the malignant plasma cell. Just as a reminder for those colleagues who are not familiar with this technology, the antibody drug conjugates are really now a backbone of treatment in cancer in general, but also in hematology. Remember, in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, we have enotuzumab, we have gemtuzumab in AML, uh, we have uh, um, brintuximab in Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, but we also uh, have uh, belantamab, for instance, in multiple myeloma, and uh, Dr. Popat will speak about this. The structure is that, on one hand, you have the antibody, uh, the uh, con uh, jugation uh, or the linker, and uh, that will allow the cytotoxic payload, uh, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, very important to uh, bear in mind. Uh, this uh, three, I would say, these three partners, the tumor-specific antibody, the linker, and the cytotoxic payload. And these are true immune uh, therapies uh, because uh, you have a different mechanism of uh, action, either an ADCC uh, process or an ADCP process. And you can see with ADCC, the antibody binds to target cancer cells and immune cells. 
and that binding triggers the immune cells to release toxic proteins to the uh, target cell. In the ADCP process, the antibody opsonized target will activate the FC gamma receptors on the surface of macrophages to induce uh, phagocytosis. And in multiple myeloma, uh, the most popular target today, uh, not only for antibody drug conjugate, but also for CAR T cells and bispecific uh, uh, T cell uh, engages is BCMA, this B cell maturation antigen, which is a member of the TNF, TNF receptor super family. And it's a very uh, attractive target in multiple myeloma because it's highly expressed and actually well-preserved uh, on the malignant plasma cells. And indeed, uh, the first approved antibody drug conjugate and relapse refractory multiple myeloma, belentamab mafodotin, is actually uh, targeting uh, BCMA. And this is uh, uh, based on several uh, preclinical uh, studies, which demonstrated selective and potent activity. Uh, also, uh, the uh, cytotoxic agent is quite specific, and you will hear this can explain, I would say, the uh, safety profile of uh, the drug. And this is about uh, the MMAF, mafodotin, uh, which is a non-cell permeable, highly potent oristatin. So uh, it is very important that, as I mentioned, uh, the drug has been granted FDA approval in August 2020, and uh, it is now uh, used in uh, different places and countries. Uh, you can see here just a flavor about uh, the uh, pre-clinical work, I would say. Uh, first, the dose dependency, but also time dependency when uh, and the capacity of uh, uh, this uh, agent, Belantamab mafodotin, uh, to uh, induce uh, uh, apoptosis and definitely this is exactly what you're looking for uh, in uh, this situation. But I think, and this is why I insisted on the fact that we're talking about true immune uh, therapies, is that belentamab can increase the ICD markers. And what is ICD? Well, this is immunogenic cell deaths. So, and uh, there is uh, a body of evidence uh, uh, which uh, is in line uh, with these uh, uh, findings. And uh, I think uh, uh, this is uh, extremely uh, important uh, when it comes to uh, treating uh, multiple myeloma. So I, th I hope I gave you a very brief overview because uh, the uh, body of data about antibody drug conjugates in multiple myeloma keeps on increasing over time. But I thought to give you a very short snapshot overview about the biology behind all this and the mechanism of action before moving now into the hard point and namely the clinical efficacy and safety of ADCs in multiple myeloma. And uh, it's again uh, my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Professor Rakesh Popat uh, from uh, London. So Rakesh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Mohammed, for that uh, kind introduction, and also for taking us through some of the very interesting background about multiple myeloma and how antibody drug conjugates can fit into the clinical pathway. It's my pleasure to join you in this uh, fantastic symposium. These are my disclosures, where we'll be talking about the role of antibody drug conjugates in multiple myeloma. I think, Mohammed, you've already paved the way with, with uh, a similar slide 
but really just to reiterate how far we've come in terms of the myeloma journey. And again, uh, just this morning, I was talking to our local group in London about the advances in myeloma. And I was talking about what I would talk call the bad old days of myeloma, where we were restricted really in terms of only having access to high dose melphalan or melphalan plus prednisolone and not much else. And of course, the situation is very much different now with a number of different therapeutics available. But with these advances also poses a number of challenges. And so the challenges that we're now facing is that we have numerous treatments available for multiple myeloma, but patients are continuing to relapse despite having access to different classes of treatment. And essentially the situation that we're finding is that most patients will be exposed to the three predominant classes of treatment. That's the prednisone inhibitors, the immunomodulatory agents, and the CD38 monoclonal antibodies very early on in their treatment pathway. And normally by the first two to three lines of treatment, you will be triple class exposed, if not triple class refractory. And that really lends itself to the question, what do we do next? And you've already alluded to the fact that we have these new therapies coming through via the uh, targeting of B-cell maturation antigen or BCMA, in addition to a number of different targets. And this is really where some of these new therapeutics, such as antibody drug conjugates, uh, CAR T-cells and bispecifics have a role in, 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 in these sorts of patients. So antibody drug conjugates have been extensively uh, investigated for multiple myeloma, but unfortunately it has quite a checkered past. And this slide really summarizes about where we are with antibody drug conjugates. And if you kind of just flip through the screen and really focus on the right-hand side of this table, you can see the current status of a number of different compounds that have been evaluated. And unfortunately, when you look at this, what you can see is the number of discontinuations in antibody drug conjugates. If you look across the rest of it, you can see that some of these have been effective, but unfortunately there seems to almost be a graveyard, so to speak, of antibody drug conjugates shown on this screen. And what I would surmise is that antibody drug conjugates, as you've pointed out, Mohammed, are, are structures of antibodies with linkers and toxins. That's how they work and that's how they kill myeloma cells. The toxins are very important in the delivery of highly potent agents to cause the disruption of the myeloma cell and myeloma cell death. But one of the problems that we're facing across the board is that these toxins can cause additional adverse events, which in some ways cannot be tolerated. Unfortunately, in other ways, the, the efficacy is poor. And you can see, again, some of these being shown out. So I think ADCs are quite challenging, but, but once they are effective, they can really be useful for patients with relapsed myeloma. And I'm going to focus on a few of these for you. So the first is an agent called lovotizumab mertansazine, or IMGN901, which is maybe a little bit easier to, to say. And this was an antibody drug conjugate, which was targeting anti or targeting CD56. And it had a toxin called DM1, which is a mitenazonide. And again, this is one of these tubulin uh, disruptors. And these are the clinical trial results, which were published, and you can see on the screen. At the bottom, you can see the uh, overall response rate. And you can see, unfortunately, this drug as monotherapy and relapse multiple myeloma wasn't very effective. Just two patients out of 37 had a partial response, and then the rest really were minor responses or no changes. If you look at the adverse event profile, it doesn't actually look too bad. Just looking at the numbers here, there's a little bit of peripheral neuropathy that was being observed. But unfortunately, this compound was not taken forward really because of the low uh, efficacy that we're seeing. Another one that was more recently developed, and this publication, which I'm citing, was actually quite recent last year, in, in duxamamide, raftanazine, or BT062, 
What was interesting about this was that uh, the initial uh, compound was focused on monotherapy, and th this is targeting CD138, which again we know is a very a good target for multiple myeloma, the cytotoxic agent being DMN4. In terms of the monotherapy, again, slightly disappointing um, efficacy was observed. There was one partial response, and really uh, the rest was either stable disease or disease progression. But nevertheless, they moved forward um, in terms of combinations. And the, the chart at the lower part of this screen looks at the combination with lenalidomide in 46 patients with relapsed uh, multiple myeloma. I think what's interesting here is that the response rate for patients who are refractory to Lendex was 62.5%, which I think suggests that there is a signal here. And, and again, if you look at uh, the patients who, who have been previously exposed to multiple different agents, you can see that, that this drug combination had some efficacy. So again, I, I would suggest that this drug has some minor uh, efficacy in relapsed myeloma. The adverse event profile didn't look too bad. Fatigue, anemia, and diarrhea. It's, it appears when I search clinicaltrials.gov that there are unfortunately no active trials looking at BT062 in multiple myeloma. Um, so it, it seems to me that this unfortunately is not moving forward. Now, you posed a question about MEDI 228 to the audience, and, and here we're going to focus a little bit more to, to help answer this question. This was my recent data, which was uh, presented at ASH 2020 by uh, Professor Shaji Kumar. And I think, again, was a very interesting compound. This targets BCMA and was at phase one trial for patients with relapsed myeloma, 56% were triple class refractory. You can see that there were a couple of dose limiting toxicities, mainly thrombocytopenia, but it moved forward to the, to the recommended dose with an expansion cohort at 0.14 milligrams per kilogram. In this cohort, I, I think there was quite a respectable response rate of 65, 66% as monotherapy for patients with multiple myeloma. And you can see here 10% achieving a VGPR and one stringent CR. Uh, with a median number of cycles received of three. But the problem which came through was with the safety data. Actually, what the commonest adverse event was photophobia. Uh, keratopathy was not observed here. And, what, and also what we saw was uh, rash, pleural effusions, thrombocytopenia, and unfortunately, that these number of adverse events led to dose delays and dose interruptions and, unfortunately, discontinuations. And as a consequence, MEDI-228 does not, at the current situation, look as though it's being taken forward. Although I'd argue that if you could do some tweaking on this uh, dosage on, or maybe the schedule of dosage, you could uh, make this a tolerable agent because clearly this does have significant monotherapy agents. So I, I would suggest for those manufacturers to maybe think again uh, about this compound. AMG224 is another antibody drug conjugate targeting BCMA. The conjugate here is DM1 and was investigated for patients who had a median of seven prior lines of therapy, typically double exposed. Some patients were triple class refractory. This was intravenous given every three weeks. And here what you can see um, is the overall response rate of 23% or 27% in the expansion cohort. Um, and the most common adverse events being um, hematological. Again, I would suggest that this was mediocre uh, response rates, but again, in combination, you could potentially see some further work. Unfortunately, again, I think the manufacturers have decided not to take this forward. Again, just showing that the bar for relapsed myeloma treatments is really quite high now uh, in terms of what is uh, expected. So you've already talked about belantamab and mafodotin in terms of what this drug is, and I, I won't repeat that. Suffice it to, to summarize the pivotal results from the DREAM2 clinical trial, which was for patients who had triple class uh, exposed multiple myeloma. Indeed, in the cohort that is shown here, which is 2.5 milligrams per kilogram, all patients were triple class refractory, which you can see on, on the screen here.
These patients had a median of seven prior lines and the overall response rate with monotherapy. Now I should stress that there was no dexamethasone in involved. Indeed, no pre-medications were mandatory as part of this. So, so I, I was just summarizing the results for belantamab mafodotin. Um, just to show the uh, progression-free survival and overall survival uh, in terms of breakdown of response, you can see the data here that those patients achieving a partial response um, or even a minor response and better have much superior outcomes, both in terms of PFS and overall survival compared to those not responders. And I think really what this tells you is what a difficult population of patients we had here. Because if you just look how steep the cutoff is in terms of PFS and OS for those non-responders, it just it, this is a very difficult to treat population. We outlined the main um, adverse events of keratopathy, but of course, this is a finding on ocular examination, slit lamp examination. So in terms of symptoms, we can see is 56% of patients had a decline in best corrected visual acuity, and 18% uh, had a significant reduction in best corrected uh, visual acuity down to 20 over 50, which is quite a significant reduction um, in eyesight. So in terms of what, what this means, in, in this table, you can see a picture of these dots and these dots represent microcysts like epithelial changes, which are essentially deposits on the epithelial membrane of the cornea, the cornea being the front surface of the eye. And we, we commonly start off with mild or grade one keratopathy, where you get these uh, microcyst like changes on the periphery. Now that does not affect your visual acuity, and normally you can carry on and continue dosing belantamab without any problems. As these microcysts increase, then you get grade two changes where you can see more uh, cyst-like changes across the periphery. And currently the guidance from the label is to withhold treatment until improvement. However, uh, most of the work that we're doing now, and again, this is very much uh, talking about the updated data, is that I think you can continue with grade two keratopathy as long as your visual acuity is okay. And that would be my, my advice. With grade three, um, typically the, the cyst-like changes span the pupil and now you're getting refraction of, of, of light as it's entering. Um, and this typically leads to blurring of vision and a reduction of visual acuity. Here, you should certainly interrupt treatment until it gets better. And upon an improvement in terms of visual acuity, you restart again at a lower dose of 1.9 milligrams per kilogram. Just to talk a little bit more off label, Mohammed, because this is what this uh, seminar is a little bit about. We are investigating lower doses at 1.4 milligrams per kilogram, which may also have an effect which you, you can consider doing. Now, the future, of course, is not in, in monotherapy and is in combinations. And a number of different trials have been performed uh, looking at belantamab combinations. I think what some of the most impressive data comes from the Algonquin trial, which was comparing belantamab with pomalidomide and dexamethasone. This is a Canadian study led by uh, Suzanne Trudell. And this is for patients with relapsed myeloma who were refractory to lenalidomide and could receive belantamab plus pomalidomide and dexamethasone. And they investigated a number of different schedules of belantamab. And the idea here, and you can see in the table on the right at the different schedules, was to try and understand how to give this balance of efficacy versus toxicity. What you can see is quite impressive overall response rates for patients who'd had a median of two to three prior lines of therapy and were lenalidomide refractory. And um, on the bottom, you can see the PFS uh, by dose and cohort, as well as prior treatment exposure. I would suggest that a median PFS of 17 months for these patients is actually quite impressive. And just for comparison, although you need to be careful, comparison trials, the Icaria trial of Isituximab and POMDEX gives a median PFS of 11 months. Um, although that may be a slightly uh, heavier pretreated population. So clearly it's a very eff effective uh, treatment that you can see. And again, just giving belantamab on an eight weekly dosing also seems to be very effective with an overall response rate of 83 months. 
If we look at the adverse event profile at the bottom part, you just to focus on the blurring of vision. And again, if you look at the Q8 weekly dosing at 2.5, you can see that the grade three blurring of vision does drop down uh, to 25%. And again, this is probably what, what we should be doing now in combination is giving uh, the dosing on a Q8 uh, sort of level. We've also combined Belantumab with bortezomib and dexamethasone. This was some early data that we presented back in 2020 on, on um, the first cohort of patients dosed at 3.4 and 2.5. You can see that the response rate was 78%, uh, which was very high. Um, patients who'd had one prior line, uh, all of those patients responded. Although if you move down, then the response rate drops to 67 or 50%. Uh, and again, the main adverse events were keratopathy. Uh, just most recently at EHA this year uh, was a presentation of Belantumab plus Revlimid and Dexamethasone for relapsed refractory patients. You can see here again, it's quite an effective treatment regimen. The future already being to reduce the dosing down. We can see the 1.9 given Q4 and the 2.5 given at different uh, schedules. Um, for these patients who, again, had relapsed refractory disease coming forward. And again, we're seeing the carfilzomib combination coming through, and this was updated actually just at the IMS meeting by uh, Dr. Quack uh, from uh, Australia. And again, this combination appears to be quite effective, 60% response rate, and again, seems to be quite tolerable in the way it's being uh, delivered. Although, uh, again, they are looking at further schedules to reduce this keratopathy rate right down. What's really interesting now is that uh, the Belantumab is moving frontline. And one of the questions that you need to pose is that if you're going frontline, uh, firstly, is the efficacy going to be acceptable? And secondary, is the adverse event profile acceptable? I think what we can see, particularly from the Bella Pomdex, uh, profile is that the efficacy in combination with an image is very good. And certainly what we're seeing here with Lendex for transplant ineligible patients that the response rate is very high, um, going from 90 to 100 percent in this small cohort that was presented. The second question is, is the efficacy uh, acceptable? Because of course, what we know is that the standard of care regimen for these patients is daratumab plus lenalidomide and dexamethasone uh, through the Maya clinical trial. What you can see here, interestingly, is that once you start reducing the dose of Belantumab uh, to 1.9 to 1.4, that the adverse event profile improves. And so I would argue that once you start reducing the, the dose, you still maintain efficacy, but you can reduce the adverse event profile so that it starts to become more acceptable for a newly diagnosed cohort. This, of course, is a phase one study, and we will await uh, further results from that. Now, finally, I just wanted to focus on, on alternatives to the ophthalmology exam, because, of course, this is an additional burden for patients to go and see an ophthalmologist. And, and also from a hematologist perspective, we get this report from ophthalmologists that we have to interpret and we have to convert best corrected visual acuity. We have to convert keratopathy into a grading according to the KVA scale and then determine whether we're going to treat a patient or not. So it's actually all a little bit complex and cumbersome. And so what we did was that we did a post hoc analysis on the DREAM2 data to see if the uh, patient reported outcome scores from the ocular surface disease index questionnaire, which is an OSDI question that we gave patients at the beginning of each cycle, could be used to guide dosing. And this is an example of the OSDI question. We ask your patients whether they're sensitive to eye, what symptoms that they have. And this tells us or gives us an idea of symptom related or function related events. And essentially, once you put this together, you can easily determine the patients who are unlikely to have grade three, four keratopathy, which is highlighted here, because those patients who have a negative questionnaire um, were only found in 6.5% of cases to have grade three, four keratopathy. So approximately 95% would not have grade three keratopathy. And so you can use that to determine dosing. So um, in terms of starting and stopping treatment. Now, 
this has evolved since we've done this analysis and we're now looking at this in prospective clinical trials in a slightly different format and we look forward to reporting this as we go along. So in summary, I would um, say that antibody drug conjugates represent a, a new therapeutic approach for myeloma. The associated toxin um, is linked to a discrete adverse event profile, and that's really where we need to focus on careful management for these, this class to be successful. And many compounds have, have failed uh, as a consequence. Belantamab mafodotin is the first antibody drug conjugate approved for multiple myeloma. The main adverse events are indeed ocular, but as time has gone on, we, we can demonstrate that by reducing the dose and giving it less frequently, this adverse event profile can be uh, more easily uh, understood and delivered. There are a number of different antibody drug conjugates in development. There's one from BMS, which is, is very exciting, and I'm hoping that we would see a readout uh, potentially at ASH, and we're looking for these to be uh, investigated further. And with that, I'd hand it back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rakesh, for really uh, an amazing, I think, overview because you managed in 20 minutes or so to give us a fantastic overview about uh, the story of ADCs in multiple myeloma. And this is the beginning of the story because actually, uh, a few months ago, maybe one year ago, we were mainly talking about uh, ADCs in the relapse refractory setting. And now you have just shown uh, the last data from uh, EHA uh, 2022 in first line in the non-transplant eligible population. So things are moving very, very quickly in this field. So we have some time for discussion and uh, we have received uh, a few questions already. Uh, so uh, thank you guys. So you can keep on uh, sending your questions and I'll do my best uh, to uh, actually share them with Dr. Popat. So first question, I'll try to structure them a little bit and we have obviously a lot of questions actually about how to use and how to manage uh, belentamab because uh, this is the only approved drug actually. So people are uh, obviously attracted and interested by this agent. So first question from a pathophysiological standpoint, uh, Rakesh, is uh, the safety profile of each antibody drug conjugate is different, actually. Yeah. So, for instance, gemtuzumab, uh, it's mainly in the liver. Uh, brentuximab, this is the nervous system. So, uh, and belantamab, for instance, this is about keratopathy. So, uh, is this something, and I guess the question is about the fact that this is specific to the linker. Maybe you can expand on this. Yeah, yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, all the ADCs have a slightly different toxicity profile. And it's not the target and it's not the linker that's responsible for it, but it's the toxin uh, that is attached. Um, and the, the toxin that is attached gives the discrete uh, profile. And actually what, what's very interesting, because these ADCs are being used not only in myeloma and hematological cancer, but also in solid tumours. And, and you can see that if MMAF is linked to a different antibody and indeed different linkers and is used in solid tumours, you get exactly the same adverse event profile, namely keratopathy. So MMAF is actually well known to cause keratopathy. And hence, when we did the first in human study, we knew that this was going to happen. And we did extensive op ophthalmology testing about this. What, what we don't know fully is the mechanism as to why it happens. It's, it, it's certainly not a BCMA related event because we know that there isn't BCMA expression on the corneal membrane. So, so it isn't due to BCMA. What it appears to be is a non-specific uptake of belantamab mafodotin by corneal epithelial cells. And as they absorb the drug onto the epithelial membrane, these microcyst-like changes form. 
And the corneal epithelial membrane is a very vibrant and uh, active regenerating part of the body and is cons consistently renewing cells. And as it renews cells, these cysts or microcysts fall off and your corneal membrane is replenished. And we see this across all different tumors that are using MMAF. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's very clear. But that brings me uh, to a few other questions, actually, from the audience uh, on how to optimize the use of uh, uh, belantamab in that case. And I think you have spent uh, uh, a lot of time uh, highlighting, actually, and sharing your experience, but also data from the literature. And uh, uh, there are two major pillars here I can see is the dosage about decreasing the dose versus increasing the duration between cycles. And maybe the truth is in between. And for instance, we had a, another question also from uh, uh, another colleague about the depths of response, whether it's a good indicator to try to lower the dose or maybe increase the duration of a given cycle. So uh, can you please give us, from a practical point of view, if you have a relapsed refractory patient today, what is your starting point and what is your algorithm depending on whether we have grade one, whether we have grade two, and apparently this keratopathy is reversible so uh, it's not about people getting, you know, blind and uh, uh, everybody's worried. So w what is your practical approach? Yeah, th th that's, th that's quite an interesting question. There's lots of aspects to that. And you're absolutely right. I, I think since Belantamab has been approved and we've all started to get more hands-on experience with it, I, th there's a number of things which have become apparent. The, the first and you're quite right, is that um, in terms of dosing, that if you give a more drug, then you get um, higher or deeper responses. But the consequence actions of that is that you get more keratopathy. Now, what we've learned across the board in multiple myeloma, and the, the bortezomib story is a, is a good example, is that more is not necessarily good. Because if you give bortezomib on a biweekly basis forever, then your patients will stop and discontinue treatment due to peripheral neuropathy. Similar situation with lantamab mafidotin. If you give 2.5 milligrams per kilogram on a 21-day basis, continuously you will, you will end up with problems with adverse events, keratopathy and others. So, so that's not the way to do it. What, what, what you can do now that we have more experience is to be able to personalize it. And this is what I do in my day-to-day -day practice. What, what, what you say is, what is the patient that I have in front of me? What is their comorbidities? What is their disease status? And then you modulate things accordingly. One of the things which I didn't mention in my talk, and I presented this at the IMS meeting just a couple of weeks ago, is that we have identified risk factors to keratopathy according to the baseline ocular characteristics. And patients who already have a degree of keratopathy or dry eye are at a higher risk of developing keratopathy. So you can also filter that into your algorithm when you're assessing your patients. What I do, always do is start at 2.5 milligrams per kilogram. And then my next dose will be dependent on the aggressiveness of the disease. If you have a patient who has aggressive disease, then I will try and deliver the next dose in about four weeks. I, I, do, I generally do not give 21 day dosing. So, so I plan to give the next dose in, in, in 28 days, uh, assuming that there is no grade three keratopathy. Um, if this is a more indolent disease, then I will extend it to six weekly dosing. And I think six weekly dosing works very nicely for patients who may not need that, that, that push. Now, once you're through the first two doses and you've got a bit of disease control, then actually you can then extend the dosing of Blantamab quite extensively to Q8 dosing, uh, for example, Q6 to Q8 dosing. Because what we do know is that the level of keratopathy is linked to the baseline levels or, or the trough levels, I should say, of blantamab mafodotin. So then you can start extending it out as you, you're seeing in, in the data that I've presented. 
Excellent. No, I think uh, your answer is very straightforward and uh, I like it a lot. And uh, actually, uh, it's very important what you mentioned because we usually simply ignore or forget about these things. Maloma is a disease of the elderly. Median age is 70. Half of the patients are above 70. And actually, uh, cataract, you know, and you know, these kind of abnormalities are the most, uh, uh, among the most frequent. I think cataract surgery is the most frequent surgery across the globe. Uh, so having this yeah. at baseline, uh, I think you're absolutely right. We need just simply to think about it. It's so obvious that you don't think about it. Uh, I mean, what, what struck me when we looked at the, the data on this was that 60% of patients it, it, who were entered into the DREAM2 study had cash racks and the general population should be 40 to 50% of our age. Um, and, and so we are causing early cataract formation because of the extensive use of corticosteroids. And, you, and again, with belantamab, although this doesn't cause cataracts, you need to bear that in mind and you need to optimize ocular health. Absolutely. And, and you're right about the deleterious role of dexamethasone because I remember well in the first trial with Lendex, actually cataract was like 5% the incidence. Oh. So let's, I, I, I think so. We have in hand uh, a drug uh, that is effective and uh, uh, it's a learning curve, I think, and one can manage it. So let's speak a little bit about the efficacy here. And we have a few questions actually about the sequencing because now we're fortunate enough, at least in some countries and places where we have different anti-BCMA targeting agents, uh, CAR T cells, bispecific antibody drug conjugates. So obviously, and I guess this is the one billion pound question, uh, is how to sequence all this because we have here and here some cohorts about, well, bispecific after CAR T cells or CAR T cells after bispecific or CAR T cells after antibody drug conjugate. So can, can you give us your thoughts? Uh, and I know there's no right or wrong answer about today, if you have everything available, how would you handle this? Yeah, I, I mean, you're right. This is um, the one billion, maybe I'd say one billion euro question, given that you're in Paris, Mohammed. Um, it, it's to, to yeah, answer. but one billion pound is more than one billion euro. <laughs> That's right. Um, I, I, I think when you look, put all the data together, and you're right, there's different cohorts that have been reported, whether you give an ADC before a bispecific or a CAR T uh, before an ADC. I think when you look at all of this together, you, you, what seems to happen is that you can salvage your patient irrespectively. So, so there, there's good data. There's data. Um, again, this is all anecdotal and case reports saying that patients uh, that fail blantabab mafodotin can be rescued effectively with a bispecific T cell engager targeting BCMA or a CAR T cell targeting BCMA. So, so what that tells you, because of course, blantabab is far more widely available than the bispecifics or CARs, that you should not be concerned about giving a patient blantabab to try and prejudice their ability to receive CAR T cells in the future when it becomes available. So, so that's the first, I think, message to, to give. The second message is that if you are fortunate enabled to, uh, be, uh, enough to be able to access some sort of CAR T cell therapy for your patients, and unfortunately that, that they do relapse, then you can salvage the patient uh, with belantabab mafodotin because the mechanisms of action are very different. We're not reliant purely on T cell activity. We have the toxin that is there. The only proviso that we need to bear in mind is antigen expression. And there have been uh, reports of, of BCMA disappearing from the surface of, of cells. Um, it, it's debatable as to how common this is. I, I'm not convinced that it's that common. I think it's probably a lower proportion of people. Um, and when you look at the cohorts where you've retreated people with BCMA-directed treatments, it doesn't seem that you need to retest them for BCMA expression. So I think the bottom line is it doesn't really matter. You should use what the most appropriate treatment and the available treatment, best available treatment that you have for your patient in front of you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I know time is running. I'll take one last question 
from, uh, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Guldern from Turkey, who is a very uh, smart young physician I met a couple of weeks ago in another meeting, actually in person. And her question is about uh, biomarkers. Do we have today a marker or whatever, you know, parameter that can allow you to predict uh, response to an anti-BCMA targeting agent? That would be amazing if we can have it. Actually. Yeah, I think that's, again, another great question. Um, so unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, when we did the early trials, one of the things that we looked at was soluble BCMA, because that's something that you can um, uh, measure in the blood. And as a patient responds, then soluble BCMA levels go down. So one of the questions that we wanted to know is that if you had high soluble BCMA levels, could that be a good marker of responsiveness to belantamaphrodotin? But actually, when you look at the results, there's no correlation. So, so unfortunately, I, I don't have an answer for you, but, but that's a great thing that people need to research into. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rakesh. And I do apologize. We can't answer all questions, but I'm sure you can send us uh, emails and we'll do our best to answer. Uh, I need now to go through the post-assessment questions, guys. And I'm asking again the same question I asked during the introduction, which is about the level of confidence uh, you have uh, in uh, your ability to interpret available efficacy and safety results of approved and emerging ADCs in myeloma and put them into clinical practice. So you're very confident, mostly confident, moderately confident, slightly confident, or still not confident despite the amazing uh, presentation of Dr. Popat. So please vote. Let's give you a few seconds here. Uh, you're doing great, Rakesh, actually. I can see the dashboard here. You convinced a lot of people there, and I'm sure uh, it looks like, yeah, fantastic. Well, fantastic. Now, almost everybody, 96% uh, is either moderately, mostly, and very confident. 20% are very confident. 48% are mostly confident. So you did a great job, Rakesh, actually. Fantastic, thank you so much. Now, let me check this one, actually. And this is about whether you are following Dr. Popat carefully, because he gave you the answer. What is the most frequent adverse event associated with Medi22A28? according to the uh, results of the phase one trial. Yeah, this is great, guys. I think now, yeah, you got the message. Fantastic. Yes, you're voting, but I think we do have the answer. 85% uh, got it right, right now, photophobia, of course. And uh, your... Uh, the next question is about, of course, the most uh, uh, frequent adverse event with Belentamab. And that was an easy one because you got it right already uh, in the pre-assessment, guys. Yes, please vote. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, everybody's great here. 100% are getting it right. Fantastic. So this is about keratopathy, but we heard very nicely how to handle this. So here I'd like to thank you all for being loyal uh, to uh, our educational activities. I'd like again to thank uh, Dr. Popat for really uh, amazing uh, work on ADCs in multiple myeloma. Uh, very grateful to all stakeholders involved in uh, the field of multiple myeloma, allowing uh, to bring these novel and great agents for our patient. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier in my introduction, even during the COVID pandemic, we've seen the approval of uh, several agents, uh, Belentamab, uh, uh, CAR T-cells, 
uh, bispecific antibodies most recently. So this is really uh, a great uh, work. And as Professor Anderson always used to say, it's United Nations against multiple myeloma. So please remember to complete the evaluation form and we'll do our best to improve our future activities. But in the meantime, wherever you are, please stay safe and keep well and see you soon, hopefully in another uh, activity. Thank you very much.